Harry, it seems that Tipperary aren't back and Limerick have put us in our box. Jeez, uh, no, I wouldn't say that, Shane. Um, <laughs> I think uh, the, the over and back that we had there at the weekend, uh, where uh, you thought we were, we were going to give you a hammer, and I, I didn't see it, to be honest. I think there's a, a very healthy rivalry and mutual respect there between both counties. And look, at the end, there was only four points in it, you know. So uh, I heard an interview from John saying it was only uh, one puck of a ball. I don't know, was he being cuter about it or what? But he was right in that sense, you know, one puck of a ball and one turnover, and it was a draw game. Like, so, so yeah. yeah. Misha, was it a hammer? Uh, it was a four point hammering, yeah, just because, <laughs> like, I suppose, like, the way they won, like, the way they came back, it was point, point, point. I know then Casey got the goal, but that just made the gap bigger. Like, that was probably the most impressive part. Uh, as I said in the as I said in commentary yesterday, you know, the clocks went forward, but <laughs> Limerick went back or Tip went back. Uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, Limerick were just, they were so impressive. They were so impressive. Like, because Tip looked really good in the first half, but like Limerick just were uh, dominant. Like, it was kind of surreal, really. Yeah, yeah. It was a little bit like the 2020 Munster final. But look now to Limerick, 128, Tipperary, 25 points. Obviously, Tipperary were great in the first half. But again, it was this huge kind of turnaround. We saw it in that Munster final a couple of years ago, especially between the 42nd minute and 61st minute. It was a run of 111 to two points. Tipperary just had one shot from play during that time. Like, it was just an incredible burst. I mean, we'll talk about the game more broadly, but just that particular burst, Barry, it was, it was unbelievable. Yeah, I think um, Colm Keyes had a stat up on Twitter there, I don't know, GC8 last night, where it was um, Limerick and Tip since 2018. I think Limerick were minus 22 in the first half and plus 63 in the second half against Tip. Do you know, so, like, it was, it was incredible, like, absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, look, as you said there, Shane, already the tip were incredible in the first half. Um, Limerick are kind of looking around the place going, what's going on here? And I don't know, was it just a case of the chat at halftime with Sean, Paul and John and the lads and just got the grips with maybe what the, the tip system was and then just came out and they knew what to do in the second half, you know, and just turned the screw a little bit um, and just asked the question because I think the first thing I wrote down uh, watching again from the throw-in was can tip maintain its intensity because like the first... First two minutes there, the hits that were going in, you could you could feel it when you were watching it. The, the intensity levels, you know, they were through the roof. And I suppose that was my big question: was were to, were to be able to maintain this for for sixty, seventy minutes? Did you so, get the opportunity to go into the game, Barry, or were you watching from home? I watched from home, watched the telly, and watched the back then again. Um, and you could like that's the thing you could even feel it through the television, like that's like the intensity straight away from the off the first hit hit that went in from Valentine in there. Um, like it was it was massive, you know. So, um. And in fairness, some they got in their faces, and I said to you the other day, like there was that, there was that closer than what people were going to make it out to be, you know. And granted, it might have been a four-point hammer, as he said in the end, but like Tip did ask a lot of questions of Limerick during the first half, you know. They they weren't taking the ball into contact like other teams would, and allow Limerick to do the trademark sworn tackle, turn the ball over, go up and get a massive score, you know, that lifts the place and lifts the the whole uh, lifts the whole team. They were taking the ball just to contact and they were spraying it out to the side, you know, they were working in their pockets, they were working in their triangles. Um and they they, you know, they moved Limerick around the place, which was quite impressive, I thought. And even their stick passing, like you always knew Tip were had a high skill set anyway. But like their stick passing was was crisp in the first half, it got them out of trouble. They worked some you know, brilliant scores and they really did ask that question. Mm, yeah, it was stressful to watch as a Tipperary person, especially the first few minutes when I thought, are Limerick going to overwhelm Tip? Tip steadied down. But did you feel like you're so you were you were writing down a note of could Tip keep up this intensity? So were you watching the first half thinking Limerick will weather the storm? You know, and there is that whole thing of being used to win as well. You kind of stay cool. You don't panic and let it get away from you. So did you feel that Limerick probably would turn it around after the break? I like. I think that's the advantage that Limerick have over a lot of teams at the moment is like a lot of the team have played together since 2017. So there's a lot of lads there that have played in that system now six, seven years at this stage. And then the sprinkling that John does with a couple of young lads or newer lads put in every so often. But the majority of the team have been in that situation of, OK, look, let's just absorb. Like Limerick are incredible at just sitting back, absorbing and then going forward again and hitting you on the break again, you know, and getting the scores and the need. It's so, um, look, they... They obviously had a good discussion at half time of what exactly was going on. Sean, you probably saw it above in the nest and relayed the information down to the lads. And I suppose when you've got a guy like Paul can work over you as well, Shane, like Paul would have probably sat down at the start of the year and put himself in other coaches' positions and said, Right, how'd you beat Limerick? And he's probably rehearsed those scenarios over and over again. Do you know? So Paul probably had the answers before he even needed to speak to the lads about having the answers, do you know. So um and in fairness, some look 
they absorbed it. They went and again, and they just they upped that intensity. Yeah. What did you make of Anisha? I mean, I'm looking at it there as a Tipperary person, and I'm delighted with the first half. Tipperary are absorbing the hits. They're tackling the right places. They're stick passing when somebody is not swarmed, and they're running it through the lines as well. So to me, I was like, okay, really, really impressive. Just like Barry, I was a little bit like, will Tip keep this up for, for 70 minutes? And obviously that didn't happen. But um, what was your read on the whole game? Yeah, it's funny. Mark Foley kind of called it right at half time, and TG Carr, where he, he was saying, that he, he, like, just from being there as well, obviously you're talking about feeling it through the TV, like he, he was there on the sideline, obviously, and he, he was, just said there's no way Tipperary can maintain this, like, and he just, he said at half time that he felt Limerick would turn it around, like. So, you know, it is really hard to play like that for a full 70 minutes. And I mean, look at the levels Limerick can get to so quickly. It, it's kind of strange to look at. And then considering the amount of people that they didn't even have, you know, from their real starting team playing, it's kind of scary, like, where you're kind of going, well, like, just if we've, if we've thrown everything at them in the first half and we're this far ahead and then they can still turn it around, like, and like I kind of mentioned earlier, I suppose, not, not even turn it around by scoring, like, three three soft goals or, or, you know, deflections or something goes in or a penalty or whatever. It was point, 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 point. They just, they took over. Um, like, one eleven to two points. Like, that's that's crazy. Uh, and then the goal, you know, Pip and Kilkenny, I suppose, really love, especially backs, a high ball dropping in and someone like Peter Casey catching the ball in the, over a full back and, and scoring a goal shouldn't really be, like, traditionally, like I suppose, let's say, the Kenyan Tipperary lads would be, you know, just sickened with that. So, yeah, like it, it was kind of shocking, uh, but then not surprising either, which kind of sounds stupid. Like, whereas you're kind of like, yeah, this is what they can do, but it's like, I can't believe they're actually doing it again. So, like, when, when we watched that game in 2020, the Munster final, the 16 point turnaround and all that, what I couldn't understand at the time was why Tip were waiting so long to make substitutions, why nobody was going down with the old Nicky Quaid, oh, my uh, contact lens isn't, uh, <laughs> oh, no, my, poor me, let's slow the game up for two minutes here. Could, thought that somebody should have done that, because there's a lot of lads who won the All-Ireland a couple of years ago on the field for Tipperary, you know, you'd think would do that. The other thing is you look at Tipperary substitutions and they happen in the 51st minute, 51st minute, 56, 65. Barry, should Tipperary not be saying, right, we've seen this a few times now, after about 40 minutes, we really are gassed against Limerick. Maybe we just make multiple substitutions in those central areas or, you know, in the engine room and make sure that we're in a position to kind of deal with the amount of energy that Limerick is going to bring to us. I think we, we'd we said that anyway, Shane, so what's the truth tell you being there live? But uh, like, again, as I made a point there earlier, I said, you don't really know what Liam Cahill and his, his backroom team are thinking. Like, they might have a guy, the S&C guy there on the, on the GPS watching that and saying, right, these guys are actually okay still. There's been no drop-off. You know, I know other, other counties have used that in the past where they see a little bit of a drop-off and straight away they're, they're pinging, you know, and they're pulling lads. But maybe he wanted to get extra time into lads, you know, maybe... He was looking at certain scenarios, looking at certain systems for later on in the year. Who knows? But look, I suppose for us, you'd say, yeah, definitely look. Lads, you could see lads were starting to get a little bit leggy there. Um, and even in the second half there, like when Limerick lads were bombing off the shoulder, like just they just they just got away. Like, you know, they were tracking runs. I think Bonner Matter and led they would never get caught for, for pace or get caught for a run like that. Just got caught by Barry Nash a couple of times, like, you know, so um so maybe he was just using it to, to get some game time to lads as well, you know, before mm. the start of the championship. So you who knows? Did you think it was naive for somebody to not go down for a minute or two, take the old helmet off? Oh definitely look when you get a run of scores and you're like that, you know, someone has to somewhere around the field just to take this thing out of it a little bit. Would it have helped? I don't know. Because, um, look, Limerick are... I, one thing I'm very impressed with Limerick this year from watching the games, they're, they're, they're quite measured, Shen. They're not... Uh, I think the, the big thing over the last couple of years from all teams in the competition has been get the ball up to that delivery zone, they call it the sweet spot there in the middle of the field and just pass it in. But, like, Limerick aren't even given that 60-40 ball anymore in favour. Like, John, they're working the ball across the field, they're working the ball to the better man in the, in the middle. They're being quite measured and quite reserved in what they're doing. And if they can't get a man off the shoulder, like they're they're trying to hold the ball as long as possible to get make sure that that ball is going in, it's going to stick and it's going over the bar, like you know. So uh, it's very hard to defend that then as well. So mm. interesting comment in here from Zed Leplin. He's he's trying to wind you up. I'd say Barry, this Limerick team have won all Ireland left in them. I think regardless, uh, 
over all the 50-50 calls they get. Every team is catching you, but eventually traditional counties will come to the top. What do you make of that? Oh, sure. Come here, look, things are cyclical, Shane. Do you know, like, um, this Limerick team isn't going to go on forever. It was the same to the Greg and Kenny teams. Do you know, it, it's cyclical. It comes in cycles, the tip teams, the Cork teams for the years. Like, will it run next course? You'd be naive to think that it wouldn't, that you know, it's going to go on forever. Like, like Limerick are bringing players through, but look, as I said, there's a puck of a wall between the top counties at the moment, and that's just my honest opinion on it. So. Keane Lynch was unbelievable again, wasn't he? Like, he's back to top four. I thought he was incredible, you know, just the way he can take the great the game by the scruff of the neck. And like Keane is probably the last person in the field that wants to shoot himself. Do you know, he's trying to bring other lads into it. He's doing just all all that donkey work that you, know, you mightn't see um necessarily all the time. But like he's coming into rocks, getting balls and just popping that ball off and running, being very direct and running direct at lads, you know. So um he's he's probably a guy you know after missing a year's hurling last year, especially you know, it did it hit him a little bit. Um, I think it's, it's a big year in store for Keane, to be honest. Yeah, and would you, Nisha? I mean, he was unbelievable. Like, he's the best player in the game, really, when he's fit. Oh, he's class. Like, that, you know, the point he got from long range there in the second half when the, when the kind of the flow started coming, when the ball came to him like a rocket, and he did that thing where he, so he used his left hand to, to make a space and guard the whole way and just bang into his hand and, and just swivels around and goes over the bar, like all in one motion, and you're kind of like, he makes it look so normal, but like it's so hard to do. And then obviously doing the pick up, uh, he missed one, got called for picking off the ground. And he's like, right, well, give me another chance at this. Like it was like a minute later, he just bang up into his hand, like, and he's like a puppet master, like like Barry saying there, like he doesn't often shoot, but he never, he like ninety nine percent of the time takes the right option, like he never like hits the ball wide. It's like right, I'm either going to pass it or it's definitely going over the bear, and then like. Another thing about Limerick too, like overall in that period when they were on top, is like it's it's, a, it's actually amazing how accurate they are. Like it's, it's some of the shots they take, sometimes you're kind of like, "What do you do?" And then you're like, "Oh, score!" You know, like like I know Seamus Flanagan wasn't playing yesterday, but he does it all the time. This kind of thing where he clicks and he's running away from the goal and he leans over his shoulder and bangs goes up, and you're like, "What the hell?" Like how how long do you have to be practicing them shots? I think Land does it on the other side off his left hand side. Like it's like it's incredible. Like um, but yeah, Keen Lynch. I, lo- I, lo- I love watching him. I love when he's playing. It was kind of annoying last year. I know, like Limerick beat Kenny, but like when you're going to the games, you want to watch Keen Lynch. So it was, I know it's obviously probably sickening for him, like that he missed it. But like they're the kind of lads you you want to watch for as long as possible and as much as possible because like he's just he's just he's a wizard, as somebody said there. Like Barry, were you? Um, I'm trying to remember. Were you on the panel when he just first started coming in, which was probably around 2015? Yeah, we made our debut together, Shane, which we believe against Clare over in Turles. So um, we've got a photo of Keane Lynch then and where he is now. They're like two different people. It's like he's actually after eating the previous Keane Lynch of 2015 <laughs> to where he is now. Um, just completely different, completely different. He was like a little whippet going around the place then. Um, yeah. No, he's just, you know, but he had it all then, Shane. Like he had it in secondary school he went to Arsenal Reach as well. And like you could see it that he was just, he was just going to be one of these generational talents. Like, yeah. He had that deadly, like, he had that deadly pony yeah. there coming out of the back of his head. Uh, yeah, like, <laughs> sorry, sorry, like, what, like, give me your early sort of memories of some of the stuff he would have done, and then even moving on to senior training in recent years. Is he one of these lads who does stuff and everyone just goes, Oh my god, how did you do that? All I know is, Shane, I know I was sitting on the bench anyway, but I, I would have been had no jersey if I was trying to do the things that uh, the Keen was doing. I'd have been sitting at home, it's uh, for every game. <laughs> um, he's just one of these lads that you'll be saying to yourself, Oh, and then you watch him do it and come after it, and you're like, It's what you expect, you know. Um, he's just he he's got a complete. Nisha said it there, like the skill set, like it's just it's mm. top quality. Do you know what he can do with a hurley in the ball for the men that just even though his hurleys, Jen, he could rock up and use a thirty six there at the start of the year, and then he's using a thirty four there half of during the year, and then he's picking up Declan's hurley half of during the year and using Declan's hurley, or he's asking Nicky to shave a little bit off the corner this hurley for him. Like you know, he just he I'd say if you give him a sweeping brush, he go out and do the same thing. So. Oh, he, and like as a kid, because he was a really talented soccer player as well. Um, was it Kevin's or someone like that in Dublin had him up at different times or whatever? Like, how good? Or do you remember him as a kid hurling or any highlights? I know you would. You were seeing it in the schools, and um, I suppose I was finishing up when he came into our school. But you would have seen it and uh, going to the earlier matches and the Dean Ryan's and the Hearty Cups. Like, and he was just, you know, what he was able to do. Like, and he was throwing balls over lads' heads, and you know, he was just he had everything, and you knew like that this fellow was going to. Who's going to make it? I'm sure. Look, I suppose the pedigree he comes from, then as well. Do you know? 
Yeah, no surprise there. Uh, Barry Nash, though, Nisha, he's really developing into just a ridiculously good player. God, he was class on Saturday as well. Oh, he was class in the second half, especially. Like, they were kind of... I know, I know Hanlon got man the match, but I... I thought, like, I was like, God, he, he's really been central in turn and this. And, and you could, like, again, like, physically see him pushing pushing everything on and on and on. And he's central in so, so many things he, they do, like, because, again, right, um, he's such a good hurler. And then the, you bring him back, corner back, and you think, like, oh, God, what's going on here? But, like, you see Saturday is the prime example of what he brings to the team. Like, on any other probably county team, he'd probably be centre back now, like, but because Hannon and the rest of them are so good around and he fits perfectly into what they're doing. And, like, you know, if there's no option down the field, Nicky Quaid's first call is, right, give it to Barry Nash. He'll do the right thing with it. He's either going to carry it out, draw a man, then pass it, or he's going to carry it to a point where like, Barry's in the sweet spot and then give it in to one of the lads inside. Like, he just, he again, he, he's a lad. He can do it all. Um, yeah, but just in a different way, obviously, than Keen Lynch. But he's so good. He's so important to that team. And that, that's the kind of thing that, like relating back to Kilkenny there that I kind of see that they're probably going to try and do the same thing with Park Walsh because I saw somebody commenting there maybe that, that Park Walsh will be under pressure to start I don't think he will because he's been brilliant the last couple of matches uh, and it, the two of them will be wearing number four probably playing a similar role their use of the ball is really good they're, they're brilliant hurlers but yeah, but Barry Nash like on his day like he's he, he's as good as you're going to get in the country really like I mean the it's no, it's no accident or mistake that he was up for hurler of the year like, last year, was it? Last year, yeah. Mm. Last year, yeah. Like, I mean, he's just, he's brilliant. Like, they're all, they're all brilliant. This yeah. Is, well, like, it's the problem. They've got 25 brilliant lads. And, like, it, it, to me now, Nash, he's he's kind of sweeping, like, uh, and sort of protecting the lads behind him. If there's two behind him, let's say Sean Finn and, and Mike Casey did other night, but if a, an attacker comes into his area, then he turns into a marker. Is it sort of like, that sort of it's zonal when it needs to be and man marking when it needs to be type set up, Barry, or, or or how do you read it? They kind of seem to be just playing it as they see it and seeing just reacting to what's what's happening in front of them. Like even using Declan as an example there, Shane, like Declan would traditionally probably sit a little bit in a lot of games, but even there in the second half, like when he needed to push up, like he he forced a turnover in the middle of the field. I think he was on the other sixty five even, which would go against everything Limerick were probably doing the last maybe four or five years spoiled the ball, stayed up around there and ended up getting a score off it, you know. And it was the same with Barry, like Barry reset when he needed to reset, when they needed to go 15 and 15, he just slapped back in and find the crosses meant him. Um, and then as the game probably evolved in a little bit again, go back to whatever system um, that they were trying to operate at that time. So mm, Shane Dowling showed last night, Mike Casey bombing on from the back a few times, of course, Barry Nash, very obviously. Like that's the new thing now, very much like, I'm not saying Gaelic football, but obviously Gaelic football backs, they do go or whatever, but there's less risk in Gaelic football because the ball can't just be popped like in two, in two seconds against the other end of the field if you move out. In hurling, obviously, it can be. But it seems to be that risk-reward thing with Limerick now. They trust that I can go as a full-back because the lads who are winning the ball somewhere in the middle sector or in the half-back line, they have such good skill sets, they'll get it to me and it won't break down, Barry. Yeah, I think it goes back to Paul's quote and maybe Shane and the freedom that he's given lads to go and hurl and express themselves and not be robotic and have to play to this strict system that you have to do this. That if a lad sees space in front of him in green grass, you're going to go and support the play as much as possible. Do you know, and I think equally, I saw um, a couple of times that say, when Mike came out there or Barry came out, like if he passed Dermot or passed Colin Cockton, like they were automatically going, right, okay, let's just retreat back here a little bit and let's just cover. So like that that Limerick, again, it comes back to them playing together for so long that like it's a system. Lads know automatically what they're doing. They're working in unison together. They're attacking together. They're defending together, you know. So, and I think that's, as I said, that's an advantage Limerick have that they're just so comfortable playing with each other for so long that they nearly know what they're doing now before they've even done it. You know, another lad knows what's going on before another lad has even done something, so... Mm. Nisha, do you reckon that um, Will O'Donoghue and Alan Tyne and that little schmozzle that they had there, that there could be anything from that in terms of disciplinary react or action? Uh, well, you wouldn't know, I suppose, that they did it in Kyle Hayes, so you'd presume now once you do it once, you have to do it all the time. So that's, this is the thing, it's like, this, this is always the biggest problem like with, with ref, and I suppose. Now, refs are definitely better than they used to be, like, and all that, but this is the, the biggest problem with ref, and it's like inconsistent. Like, so. If you've but done it's an it impossible game to. It's actually an impossible game to referee if you think about. It. There's thirty lads all trying to get an edge on each other. 
But at this thing, and, and, and it moves so fast. Like so Richie Hogan got a, a belt off the ball or he ended up getting taken off probably maybe a little minute later. I didn't see what happened. No, nobody seems to see what happened to him. He was just on the ground and the ball was on the far side of the field because like, everyone's following the play. So, But like this is the thing. So, But if it was caught in camera, like it has to be looked at, I suppose, because if you're if you're going to do it once, you have to do it every time. Like you either ignore it all the time, or you you you, you follow it up all the time. It can't be. Oh well, we, we'll pick this instant, and then we'll pick this one, but we won't bother with that one. We won't bother with that one either. Like it has, to, you have to look at them all. Like so, I presume they look at it, and if they see something like it, they'll be in trouble. Like, mm, but it, when you look at the likes of Barry Murphy, um, the performance he gave Barry. Like and Darrow O'Donovan to come back in as well. Limerick aren't too badly off, even if Will O'Donoghue does end up suspended. No, oh, look, I think there's a, the, the depth is there in the panel. Is, and like you've had him English there as well, Shen. You know, you've like you've three, three doing leads there fighting for that one spot in the middle of the field. And, you know, in fairness to Barry, like similar to Barry Nash and to maybe to a couple of leads that reinvented themselves out around the middle there. Um, gives you something very similar in terms of a, a skill set that Dara has. Um, but look, Williams a unique player too. Like you know, he's uh, he any team that he's in, and if he wasn't in it, you're going to miss him there. But look, they'll they'll find someone to go in there, I suppose. Mm. Here, here's the oddest stat of the match in the second half. Barry Limerick had zero wides. Ronan Maher had two, and Tipperary otherwise had none as well. Have you ever come across a stat like that? No, but uh, it just goes back to my point about just like. Limerick aren't taking on things that they, you know, they don't need to take on. Like they're being so measured in what they're doing in terms of their build-up play, making sure it's nearly like international soccer where they're nearly wearing you down. You know, they're switching ball across the field, working ball to the middle. Is it on to go forward with line break? Okay, it's not. We'll go. You know, we'll go to the other side of the field now, and they're making sure that when that pass goes in there, that it's going to stick and it's going to be a score. Like like that's what I've been incredibly impressed with. Like it's it's like a new dimension to their game. You know, it's not just trying to break that game line of the 45 anymore, but just absolute robust runners and one and two off runners. Um, mm. They're being really, really measured in what they're doing and where they're delivering the ball from and where they're shooting from, especially. You know, it's very rare that you see, unless situation dictates, but it's very rare you see a Limerick player shooting from outside the 65, unless they're Dermot, you know, or Colin Coughlin as well. Um, even Declan is taking that ball past the halfway line into the 65 and making sure that it's going over the bar. Like, mm. Yeah, like Colin Coughlin's mishit shot led to the goal. Like uh, uh, last year, I was uh, involved with the UCD Freshers against the UL Freshers, and oh my God, Colin Coughlin with four points from playing the first half. He's some shooter, to be fair to him. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you, uh, Barry, was to do with, um, like, you know, the commitment, I would imagine, the commitment of all intercounty players is huge. But like, you know, if you have a, a Limerick training session at half seven, we'll say on a Tuesday or something like that, what time are lads there? I presume they're all doing their own work beforehand, out poking away and getting in extra shooting work or whatever. Yeah, look, John actually kind of put a stop to that over the years, and the lads were nearly getting there too early and doing too much before training, that they nearly were out in the field an hour. Well, the goalies were always out earlier anyway, but um, no, look, lads that have pre-session or pre-session work to do, whether you're a forward or a back or whatever, and you'd kind of spend 20 minutes before the session doing you know, whatever little bits you had to do um, before the main session started, you know, so... In fairness, it's incredibly laid back to what it was when I first came onto the county panels. You know, I was very regimental, very tight, you know, very, very strict, where you felt you were just constantly wound up to where now it's it's just so relaxed. And I think you can really see it in the Limerick team, especially that lads are enjoying each other's company and they're enjoying what they're doing as well. You know, they're going around, uh, if you're an opposition player there and you're watching Key Lynch go around a smile on his face, it's going to just annoy you for the whole 60, 70 minutes, you know, so... Uh, just before I let you go, um, Barry, how do you think the league final will go? And then the second thing I'm going to ask you is, who are the three teams that are going to come out with Munster? But starting off with the uh, with the league final, I'm going to have to say Limerick or the Limerick win. Um, and I I do think it'll be a lot closer. Then I uh, like I know you're probably sick of me saying this already this morning, but I do think that the teams are getting a lot closer. You know, there isn't that much of a gap that there is anymore. So and I think it will be highly competitive. To be honest, with you. and again, the two weeks you probably have the last week of hard training that you have before championship this week um so again what's going on behind closed doors no one really knows and how teams are going to treat it like it's still a national competition obviously with a medal and a trophy at the end of it so obviously teams will give it the, the respect but i'm hoping for a limerick win anyway yeah um, and then that final one the tricky one who's coming out of monster it's very tricky um I think Nisha said something really interesting a while ago. I do think that Watford are going to be a completely different team to what they were in the league. Um, there's always a bit of a bounce uh, from a Davy team, especially. So, I, I Clare is again, I don't know. If, I, I think people are reading too much to what was going on in Clare. Like they've gone, they're, they're extremely quiet at the moment. There's no stories coming out of there. Normally, you'd hear something. 
Um, Limerick will come out of it. I do fancy Tip to come out of it as well. And I do think it's going to be a toss of a kind in between Waterford and Clare. So you're you're kind of hedging your bets a little bit and you're saying that uh, Cork won't come out? I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I just I don't know. Sti- I don't know. Still a, yeah, there's still a bit of a question mark there. I have to say Tipperary now, Shane, because there's, uh, there's family ties with Tip, so, um, so I have to say that. Or the, that's okay. the family I'll be lynched. So... Um, but I do, I do like the style of play that Liam has instilled in over there. Like you know, they are they're, they're hurling really well at the moment. But I think I do think it's a toss of a kind for a third spot. Any team in their day, you know, could get like Water probably got to Torles might stand against them, even though they're all saying they, they love playing playing in Torles. You know, um, nope. squad depth with squad depth, Jen, will be a big thing. You know, unfortunately that Waterford have suffered traditionally suffered a couple of injuries in the group stages the most championship over the years that have probably hampered their progress. So if they can keep lads healthy. I'd like to think that they come through it, but again, I don't know. Yeah, so TV Street says uh, all the girls have lovely bottoms, basically, is what Barry Hennessy is saying. <laughs> <laughs> more more water, I think, was uh, Father Jack's present, but more water. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Barry. Great having you on the show, and no we'll be chatting again hopefully soon. Thanks, Les.